This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back the great dynamic rock drummer, Sandy Gennaro, a man who played with Michael Bolton in his original band, Blackjack. He played with Cindy Lauper, Pat Travers, The Monkees, and many others. And um, he has a, a new book out called Beat the Odds in Business and Life. I guess it's part autobiographical and it's also part extension of the, um, of the um, motivational speeching motivation motivational speeches that he does um you know uh, throughout the uh, world and stuff when he travels um and it's going to be a, a a good conversation i had a great conversation with him last september when we talked and it's going to be great to have him back so um he can talk about the book and stuff you know he's a an eternal optimist you know he believes you know hard work pays off and he believes that everybody should treat each other respectfully, which I 100% agree with. And I'm very intrigued by this book and by, you know, this message that he's sending out to the world. And so it's going to be great to talk to Sandy again. Also, too, sadly, rest in peace, Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek and the Star Trek movies. She sadly passed away at the age of 89. She, I, I had been hearing for years that her health wasn't great and that she was going to retire from the conventions, but then she kept coming back and stuff. And it's absolutely sad, but she lived a long and amazing life. One of the first ladies to show her belly button on network TV back in the 60s, alongside my other past guest, Barbara Luna. Rest in peace, Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura. So yeah, here is my new interview with Sandy Gennaro. Hello. Hey, Sandy. Welcome back. Hey, thank you very much. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. What are you up to today? Uh, just my, you know, my day is just beginning and starting it off with you, Sandy. Oh, awesome. Uh, you're in yeah, you're in California, right? Yes, Redding, California. All right, sounds good. Awesome. So your book, "Beat the Odds in Business and Life," uh, great title, by the way. Um, it was recently released, right? Uh, yes, it was released in May. Okay. Uh, like May May twenty second, it went to Amazon. <laughs> nice. What What made you want to write this book? What made me want to write this book? Well, you know what? I, I've been speaking on the subject uh, to corporate and to uh, different conferences and associations and stuff for about four years. Mm -hmm. And it was constantly uh, recommended to me, hey, man, you got to put this in writing. This is an awesome message, uh, and it applies to everybody, no matter where they are in business or in life or whatever. It, it It's like a catch-all... Uh, it's a, it's a catch-all... Uh, mindset that that leads to success and a less stressful life and you know whatever i i you know a lot of people said to me you know uh, how come you always you always seem to be at the right the people that know me for a long time no oh, sandy you always seem to be at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. uh you know regardless of what happens in your life you never seem so stressed out whatever um you know you you, you always seem you know it's so so I, I basically was urged by people that hear my message and to witness my life from afar. Um, they said, you got to put this in writing because, you know, the way you think and the way you act and the way your perception of things and the way you treat people, everybody has to hear that, uh, you know, the, that your success story in, in, uh, in, as a result of the way you treat people and the way you perceive events that happen to everybody. So that's basically... Why I wrote the book is that it was highly suggested to me by several different people, just not just friends of mine, but you know CEOs that I speak to, and you know heads of big big companies and stuff. They said, "Man, you got to put this in writing." So that's what I did. I, I hooked up with a, a, a partner of mine, and um, he's a psychologist, uh, Steve Olivas, and um, mm -hmm. I sent you a copy of the book, didn't I? 
No, not yet. Oh, I haven't. Okay, I will. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, after we get after we get off the phone, just uh, uh, text me or email me your address, and I'll be happy to do that. Oh, I appreciate that. I sure will. Uh, what was it? What was it about public speaking that made you want to get into it? Are we recording now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know that. It's okay. Um, what made me get into speaking? Well, you know what? Just like every other gig that I've gotten in my whole life, every single high high profile playing gig that I've gotten has been as a result of a relationship that I had with a person, it directly or indirectly related to that person who I had a relationship with. And that's how I basically got into speaking. I never got a gig through a resume. I never got a gig through statistics. I never got a gig. Uh, I've always got every single gig, including the speaking gig, through a relationship or how I reached out to a person without any any return, without any idea of an agenda or what what can this person do for me? Uh, I'll reach out to her, but uh, mm. what could she do for me? There was never an agenda. Yeah. And when, when you reach out to people and you service people and make people fortunate for having crossed your path, uh, without no agenda, the universe, God, uh, the higher power, the God energy, the whatever you want to call it, he has, or they, or the energy, it's not, a, it's not a gender-related thing. It's not a he or she. Mm -hmm. uh, the God energy, the power greater than ourselves that work in our lives, will create an agenda for you. In other words, how I got into speaking, I threw it before speaking was, uh, was not even a consideration of what I was going to do when I didn't want to go out on the road with a rock band anymore. Mm -hmm. I threw a drumstick to a handicapped person uh, in an arena gig in San Diego in 2015. Oh. And uh, I made sure she got the stick, even though it was intercepted by the person next to her. I made sure she got it. I wanted to engage this person in the wheelchair. And the next day, the husband reaches out to me um, through a Facebook messenger and says, uh, you know, can I, can I have your phone number? I want to call you. I want to thank you in per you know, I want to thank you for what you did. And for my wife last night, she was crying on the way home as you made sure she got the drumstick out of 20,000 people, et cetera, et cetera. So I spoke to him, and he was very, very grateful. He put his wife on the phone, and she was almost in tears. Thank you so much. Oh, no big deal, no big deal. But the husband is a speaker. He came to Nashville and wanted to meet me for coffee to thank me in person. I met him. I told him how I got certain gigs. I told him how I got Cindy Lauper's gig, et cetera, et cetera. He uh, invites me to his speaking engagement, which is right after our coffee meeting. Mm -hmm. And he told us he told the story of how I got Cindy Lauper's gig in the in the corporate environment, and it got a really good response. And he said, "You know what? That story is very, very strong. And you have experience speaking in front of you know drummers and you know uh, musicians at schools and clinics and whatever." He said. You have the talent to speak in front of people. You have that experience, but now you should spread that message to everybody that will hear it. And I will help you become a speaker. I, I will be your muse. This gentleman, the husband of the person in the wheelchair, is a very successful speaker. And he, oh. uh, he encouraged me to be a speaker, and he became my mentor, my speaking mentor. And that was basically the first domino to fall. And then I started getting my PowerPoint presentation together. I started speaking for, for uh, Rotary Clubs and Chambers of Commerce here in Nashville. And, um, uh, and that's basically what started the speaking career. And now I speak for a worldwide organization called Vistage, which is a CEO peer group. Uh, and they have meetings once a month. There's like chapters all over the world. So they have a speaker at all of their meetings, and there's hundreds and hundreds of meetings all over the country every month. So I'm busy doing that. And then that's, that's parlaying into me speaking to individual companies uh, because the, the Vistage members are CEOs of all their individual companies. So some of them hire me based on my Vistage speak, my Vistage presentation. They hire me to speak for their company. And then their companies also belong to associations that have conferences. 
yearly conferences in Vegas or Orlando or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, I, and now I've been speaking to conferences as well. So once I started speaking, then the snowball started rolling down the hill and it just got bigger. More people had heard it mm-hmm. and want me to speak for other situations. So that's how it basically started. Is, and that, that throwing a drumstick to a person just to put a smile on her face is basically that story is in the book. And, um, and that's basically how I got the monkey's gig. That's basically not throwing a, a drumstick, but reaching out to somebody, doing a favor for somebody uh, without anything in return. Led to the monkey's gig, uh, reaching out to signing an autograph when I was in a really big hurry and I had every opportunity to blow, blow this guy off. Uh, that signing an autograph and engaging this to this dame in the doorway, so to speak, uh, that led to my Cindy Lauper gig. The Cindy Lauper gig, uh, during that Cindy Lauper tour in 1984, I met the person that became my wife mm-hmm. and we're married for 36 years. So, oh, congrats. Basically, you know, treating somebody like a human being, no matter where they are in your perception of that person. It could be a fan wanting an autograph. It could be somebody on the street. It could be somebody checking your groceries in the super, in Ralph's supermarket. It could be anybody. You treat them with respect. And when you do that, you do that with no agenda. And the universe has an agenda because the universe, you know, you send something, something out into the universe and it comes back to you good or bad, and that's a law of the universe. It's not my opinion, Mm -hmm. it's a fact that what you send out, you get back. What you want in your life, give it away, and you will get more of it. In cause and effect, action, reaction. It's laws of physics and it's laws of the universe. This is how the universe works. I I couldn't agree. And I'm just trying to spread that message to just try to make everybody think in those terms. And if everybody did think in those terms, there would be no war. There would be no discord. You know, regardless of how people feel politically, they can, they can, uh, you know, they can uh, subscribe to any political agenda they want. I'm not going to hold it against them because it's different than mine. You know, so regardless of your politics, regardless of your sexual orientation, do you like boys, do you like girls, it don't matter. Everybody's a human being and everybody has a right to live their life and believe what they want to believe. So, but, but everybody deserves, no matter what their political uh, stance is or, um, you know, sexual orientation or whatever, everybody deserves a common denominator uh, of respect because they're a human being. And human beings have something inside them called a soul. And that's what makes us all the same, regardless if you're the CEO of a company or if you're somebody that empties the waste baskets in that company. We're all, we all have that in common. And sometimes, yes, I agree, you might be saying to yourself that, hey, what about the guy that ripped me off? What about the guy that, that, that mugged my, my grandmother? What about that guy? Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? You can pull the shade out of that guy and, and, and you don't spend your life in a, in a sense of revenge or in, in trying to get even with somebody. You just do your best to reconcile it in a same, in a same calm way, unconfrontational. And if you can't reconcile the situation after uh, repeated effort, then what I do is, is close the proverbial shade down on that person and pretend that they moved to outer Mongolia without cell service or internet. You just shut them out of your life and and that's it. And you let God and let let go and let God. Let the universe take care of his karma or her karma, the person that, that you know, mugged your grandmother or something. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, it's, it's, so that that's basically you know, I get so emotional about it because it's it really, really uh it's it's very it's a very very simple message, but people miss it. People miss the message, and I'm trying to you know reengage them. And the fact that makes my presentation successful is the fact that I wrap the message around very popular artists that I work with mm-hmm. and very popular songs that I played and were involved with. So that's the common denominator that everybody knows these songs. And everybody knows these artists. 
no matter where you are in the world, everybody knows these artists. So that's what makes it, that's what opens the door to my message to these people, the fact that we already have, before I say a word, we already have something in common. It's the music. Yeah, I, I couldn't have agreed more, Sandy. I mean, we live in this strange time now of nothing but uh, arrogance and tribalism and whatever you right. want to call it. It's it's. I never thought this was going to happen in my lifetime. Right. You know, it's a it's a it's an us against them mentality, and I don't get it. Yeah. I just don't get it. You know, I don't. I don't get it. So listen. We can only do so much to control the way other people think, but as I said before, you do your best. But after that, you just pull the shade down. I mean, you know, good luck. I don't wish you any harm, and uh, I just let let the let the universe take care of it. And and it leads to a very stressless life. You know, it just leads to it just takes away a whole bunch of stress. Right. Uh, because, you know, about things you can't control. You can't control who, what, what somebody believes should be the president. You can't control that. So don't try to control it, and that alleviates the stress. Uh, did you start writing the book during quarantine? I did. Early, uh, yeah, early, it was like in the middle of 2019, and then I think we were, started quarantine in like 2020 or whatever. But I used to do... Um, you know, Zoom calls with my my uh, ghostwriter, and uh, and that's mm -hmm. how we got it together. And then when it started, you know, lifting up a little bit, we used to wear masks and be in the same room, and you know, to record the book and whatever. So yeah, it was mostly done uh, during the pandemic. Did Did you have times in your career where you thought about um, you know giving it up because you know you just didn't think you could you know succeed any further? when I moved to L.A. from New York to get my first big break in the music business before I'd done anything of note in the music business. And I, after three years of being in L.A., nothing was really happening, but I finally got an audition with Rod Stewart. Right. And, uh, and, and, uh, during, and, and the uh, audition was held in a studio where all the instruments were provided. And I, even though the instruments were provided, I proceeded to bring in my own drum set because I was very insecure about playing on another drum set. So obviously, I didn't get that audition because I made Rod Stewart wait a half an hour while there, <laughs> while there was a drum set already, you know, already for me to play. And I wait, made him wait a half an hour while I set up this big double bass drum set when I had to play the Tonight's the Night was the song. So it was a very simple song. So anyway, I didn't get that. And I thought about, I thought I blew the biggest opportunity I had uh, thus far in my life. And... I was 3,000 miles away from home. My relationship at the time uh, with my former, my, my first wife wasn't working out. I had no money. The whole LA experience was very, very um, disheartening. And um, again, because of my association and my friendship with a guy named Carmine Apice, who was a famous drummer, Yep. Um, he, uh, he was my drumming muse, even when he was in the Finella Fudge in New York. I used to go see him all the time. I made friends with him when I was in L.A. Mm -hmm. And I told him about the Rod Stewart audition. And I, and, he, and I said to him, you know, Carmine, I don't think they found anybody yet for the, for the Rod gig. He goes, you got management's number? And I said, yeah. And I gave him management's number. He went down and got the gig. He went down and got the gig and played with Rod Stewart for seven records, several tours. And he co-wrote, do you think I'm sexy with Rod Stewart? Right. Um, amongst other songs. So, and then, but the moral to that story, and I'm not finished yet. The moral to that story is Mr. Rockstar Carmine Apice, who not only played the, at the time, played in the in the Fudge. Or he played with Ozzy Osbourne. He played with Ted Nugent. Right. He gets the biggest gig and by his own admittance. He gets the biggest gig in his life from the little unknown drummer that's trying to get his first gig in Los Angeles. Yeah. He said. <laughs> Use your my name as and any any kind of reference, Sandy. You can use my name. I, I support you and whatever. I have your back. So I wrote resumes out to fifty managers that I really um, uh, really enjoyed the the bands that they managed. And one of the fifty managers typewritten on a typewriter, and my only reference was Carmine. And I sent the resume to fifty managers of bands that I really liked. And one of those bands was Led Zeppelin, and the manager was Peter Grant based in England. 
but all of Peter Grant's mail went to an office in New York City, which which housed uh, Led Zeppelin's attorney, mm -hmm. Steve Weiss. And right at that time, my resume arrives at Steve Weiss's office. His name is not even on it. He, he didn't put my resume in a, in a box to be forwarded to England. He opens the resume. That's the universe working on my behalf. He opens the resume. He's right at that period of time in Steve Weiss's life. He's trying to get a record deal, the first record deal for Michael Bolton. And he's shopping songs with Michael and Bruce Kulick's songs. He's shopping at the different labels. And the labels are getting back to him saying, we want to see this band. We like the songs. Steve Weiss goes, okay, uh, set up a showcase. We'll set up a showcase. But then he says, well, I need to find a rhythm section. I got the singer and the guitar player, then Michael and Bruce. Right at that time, he opens my resume, which doesn't even have his name on it. And he sees Carmine's name on it. And the coincidence is, this is how the universe works, uh, mm -hmm. Tommy, that he sees Carmine's name and... Steve Weiss, believe it or not, used to be the attorney for Vanilla Fudge, Carmine's first band. Right. He knows him personally. So he calls Carmine. Carmine vouches for me. The next, the next get call I get is from the, Matt, the attorney for Led Zeppelin. I was in L.A. and he said, do you want to fly to Carmine? He tells the story. I call my vouchers for you, whatever. Do you want to fly to New York and audition for this yet unnamed band? I flew to New York, played on a strange drum set, finally. And... Um, and I got the gig. The, the band was called Blackjack, and it, and it was uh, it was me and right. Michael Bolton before Michael was famous on his own. He was right. in a band called Blackjack. I was the drummer. Bruce, Bruce Kulick, you know who Bruce Kulick is? Oh yeah, from Kiss. Right. He was the guitar player before he did anything noteworthy. He was the guitar player in the band, and Jimmy Haslip, who went on to be the bass player, and musical director in the Yellow Jackets, he was the bass player. So. It was, it was a super group before there were super groups. We all went on. We all are in the in the business still after all these years. Uh, all you know, very successful in the business. Whatever. So yeah. that was my first gig. So yeah, that, to answer your question, long-winded answer, but uh, <laughs> to answer your question, when I was in LA and I blew that Rod Stewart audition, uh, that was the, the the lowest point in my life, and I I was about to throw the drumsticks in the, in the fireplace. But Carmine, you know, had my back. And I had the image of Ringo on Ed Sullivan, which I always had in my mind. Um, and I visualized me myself on stage and whatever. I never lost hope, even though I was close to losing hope in that situation in L.A. Yeah, did you learn a lot about behaviors from uh, stars you worked with in the business? Did I learn a lot about what? About behaviors. Uh, yeah, I learned... I learned more about how not to behave. Well, I learned both. Yeah. Working with the artists, working with the artists and managers that I worked for. Yes, there's some some artists and managers that will remain nameless that uh, that they taught me what not to do and mm -hmm. how not to treat people. These are these are artists and managers that that get they're in the gimme gimme. What what's it going to do for me? Yeah. I'm only going to talk to you if you can offer me something. Those are the artists and managers that, that I learned what not to do. And then more so, the artists and managers that I, that I learned a lot of positive stuff from, those are the artists and managers that you steal that are still around today, like Cindy Lauper and then Joan Jett. And, you know, somebody before his death, he was in the, in the business for over 50 years, both did we. And I had the opportunity to be his musical director for a while, uh, his drummer for the last five years and his musical director for the last year or so. But those are the people that I learned the most from. Mickey Dolan's and the Monkees, uh, you know, he, he holds on to bands for a long, long time. You know, Davy Jones is another one that I learned a lot of positive stuff from. So the people that you know that I worked for mm -hmm. or worked with, those are the people I learned a lot of positive things for. How to keep a band, how, how to, you know, to where an artist recognizes the band instead of putting them all in black in the back of the stage and the, the spotlight is just on them. You know, it's not. It's the, you know, Cindy used to introduce her band by first and last name every gig. Every national TV show we did in Europe, uh, in the U.S., she used to always mention the name of the band and always be curious about how we were doing. In other words, you know, has everything going? Is it, you know what I mean? She yeah. showed that she cared. 
about the band. It's about relationships. It's not about drumming only. It's right. not about, you know, what, you know, how you read music. It's not about the, your drumming chops or your chops on a guitar. It's not just about that. It's about relationships between you and the person you work with, you're sharing the stage with, or it's between you as a CEO and the people that work for you, you know, in your product or service, in your company. It's about relationships, and that's what I try to convey in my presentation. Oh, that's wonderful. How's the uh, response been since the book came out? It's been really, really good. I, I, I haven't really done a hard launch yet. I, um, I hired a, uh, a marketing team to help me launch the book on, you know, with MailChimp, with email marketing and, um, and social media and stuff like that. So I think, it, I think by next week, which, which is going to be, um, it's going to be hard launched, uh, an official launch. But as I said, it's been on Amazon for, for about a, maybe a little over a month now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's going fairly well being, being that it's just a word of mouth thing now. And a couple of people are posting stuff about it showing the cover of the book you know without me actually doing anything and you know based on that it's going pretty well actually i'm very fortunate oh that's great How, how's your uh, cover band doing the cover band is doing good rock united is uh is doing you know fairly well we, we play maybe two or three times a month and uh we you know we basically play 70s 80s cover songs and uh, basically i'm playing all the songs i played in the 70s and 80s it's fun so yeah, we do a casino here and there. We do a festival. We do you know whatever. Every, every everywhere everywhere that a, a cover band would play, we, we kind of try to get those gigs. And we, we don't do four or five sets a night and get out of there at three in the morning. I'm done with that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but we do one or, one or two sets in a casino or a festival, an outdoor gig, or you know now that the summertime is here and the fall, there's a lot of uh, you know counties and in uh, communities that have festivals and stuff, and they like cover bands, so it's fun to do it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a partner in the cover band, me and the singer are partners, and um, it's fun. I'll always, I'll always play, no matter how successful the speaking gig becomes, uh, I'll always play the drums in, in a band. Yeah, do you have any upcoming shows? Um, I was just off the phone, um, as a matter of fact, I do. the Rock and Pod Expo this year? Um, you know what? We played, at, we played at the Rock and Pod promotional gig at, at a club called Bowie's here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was just last weekend. Uh, yeah, that was uh, July... Yeah, that was July the 9th. Uh, he didn't have an in-person Rock and Pod this year. I, don't, I think something huh. happened with the venue or something. Mm -hmm. having it he's having the next rock and pod in april of 23 oh, okay I'm be part of that i'm going to be definitely part of that nice nice so beat the odds in business and life is available on amazon and uh, your website yeah you can go directly you can search my name or the title of the book on amazon and it'll come right back up uh or if you'd like a signed copy if anybody would like to sign copy of the book, they go to my website, sandygenero.com, and they fill out a little form with your address and whatever, and uh, I have signed copies available there. I'll be happy to personalize it and send it to you. And then there's also an option to, uh, if you want a pair of Beat the Odds drumsticks, you can also get those signed uh, and sent to you uh, 
Fantastic. Well, I hope the book continues to be successful, and uh, I'll send you my address on um, Facebook. And thank you so much for coming on and talking about it. Yeah, we're very welcome. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you so much. Uh, my, my pleasure, Sandy. You have yourself a great day. Enjoy the rest of your summer and kick ass at those gigs. Okay, thank you so much, and we'll, we'll speak soon. Good luck to you and all the best to you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. All right, Tommy. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Sandy Gennaro. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, my God. He is just such a great guy, and he's filling the world with his wisdom on treating others the way you'd like to be treated, you know? I just I love that. I, I can't tell you how much I love it. We need it in this day and age, trust me. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.